Chapter 3. The Penalty of Failure Daylight crept over the tossing waters of the Bay of Biscay to reveal a small boat riding on its wide expanses. It was a very crowded boat. In the bows huddled the French crew of the sunken brig Marie Gallant, amidships sat the captain and his mate, and in the stern sheets sat midshipman Horatio Hornblower and the four English seamen who had once constituted the prize crew of the brig. Hornblower was seasick, for his delicate stomach, having painfully accustomed itself to the motion of the indefatigable, rebelled at the antics of a small boat as she pitched jerkily to her sea anchor. He was cold and weary as well as seasick after his second night without sleep. He had been vomiting spasmodically all through the hours of darkness, and in the depression which seasickness brings, he had thought gloomily about the loss of the Marie Gallant. If he'd only remembered earlier to plug that shot hole! There had been so much to do, and so few men to do it with. The French crew to guard, the damage aloft to repair, the course to set, the absorbent qualities of the cargo of rice which the Marie Gallant carried had deceived him when he had remembered to sound the well. All this might be true, but the fact remained that he had lost his ship, his first command. And in his own eyes, there was no excuse for his failure. The French crew had wakened with the dawn and were chattering like a nest of magpies. Matthews and Carson beside him were moving stiffly to ease the, their aching joints. Breakfast, sir, said Matthews. It was like the games Hornblower had played as a lonely little boy when he had sat in the empty pig trough and pretended he was a castaway in the open boat. Then he had parceled out the bit of bread or whatever it was uh, which he had obtained from the kitchen into a dozen rations, counting them carefully. One, each one to last a day. But a small boy's eager appetite had made those days very short, not more than five minutes long. After standing up in the pig trough and shading his eyes and looking round the horizon for the sucker that he could not discover, he would sit down again, tell himself that the life of a castaway was hard, and then decide to eat that, that another night had passed, and that it was time to eat another ration from his dwindling supply. So here under Hornblower's eye, the French captain and mate served out a biscuit of hard bread to each person in the boat, and filled the pannikin for each man in turn from the water breakers under the thwarts. But Hornblower, when he sat in the pig trough, despite his vivid imagination, never thought of this hideous seasickness, of the cold and the cramps, nor of how his skinny posterior would ache with its constant pressure against the hard timbers of the stern sheets, nor, in the sublime self-confidence of childhood, had he ever thought of how heavy could be the burden of responsibility on the shoulders of a senior naval officer at age just seventeen? He dragged himself back from the memories of that recent childhood to face the present situation. The grey sky, as far as his inexperienced eye could tell, bore no presage of deterioration in the weather. He wetted his finger and held it up, looking at the boat's compass to gauge the direction of the wind. Backing westerly a little, sir, said Matthews who had been copying his movements. That's so, agreed Hornblower, hurriedly going through his mind his recent lessons in boxing the compass. His course to weather Ushant was nor'east by north, he knew, and the boat close hauled would not lie closer than eight points off the wind. He had lain to the sea anchor all night because the wind had been coming from far too north to enable him to steer for England. But now the wind had backed. Eight points from nor'east by north was nor'west by west, and the, we and the wind was even more westerly than that. Close hauled, he could weather Russian, and even of a margin for contingencies, to keep him clear of the lee shore, which the seamanship books and his own common sense told him was so dangerous. We'll make sail, Matthews, he said. His hand was still grasping the, bis the biscuit which his rebellious stomach still refused to accept. Aye, aye, sir. A shout of the Frenchmen crowded in the bows drew their attention. In the circumstances, it hardly needed Hornblower's halting French to direct them to carry out the obvious task of getting in the sea anchor. But it was not too easy, with the boat so crowded and hardly a foot of freeboard. The mast was already the mast was already stepped, and the lug sail bent ready to hoist. Two Frenchmen, balancing precariously, tailed onto the halyard, and the sail rose up the mast. Hunter, take the sheet, said Hornblower. Matthews, take the tiller. Keep a close hold on the port tack. Close hold on the port tack, sir. The French captain had re has watched the proceedings with intense interest from his seat amidships. He had not understood the last, decisive order, but he grasped its meaning quickly enough when the boat came round and steadied on the port tack, heading for England. 
He, st he stood up, spluttering angry, angry protests. The wind is fair for Bordeaux, he said, gesticulating with clenched fists. We could be there by tomorrow. Why do we go north? We go to England, said Hornblower. But, but it would take us a week. A week even if the wind stays fair. This, this boat, it's too crowded. We cannot endure a storm. It is madness. Hornblower had guessed at the moment the captain stood up what he was going to say, and he hardly both bothered to translate the expostulations to himself. He was too tired and too seasick to enter into an argument in a foreign language. He ignored the captain, nor for anything on earth but he turn the boat's head towards France. His naval career had only just begun, and even if it were to be blighted on account of the loss of the Marie Galant, he still had no intention of rotting for years in a French prison. Sir, said the French captain. The mate, who shared the captain's thwart, was protesting too, and now they turned to their crew behind them and told them what was going on. An angry movement stirred the crowd. Sir, I insist you head towards Bordeaux, called the captain again. He showed signs of advancing upon them. One of the crew behind him began to pull the boat hook clear, and it would be a dangerous weapon. Hornblower pulled one of the pistols from his belt and pointed it at the captain, who, with the muzzle four feet from his breast, fell back before the gesture. Without taking his eyes off him, Hornblower took a second pistol with his left hand. Take this, Matthews, he said. Aye, aye, sir, said Matthews, obeying, and then after a respectful pause, begging your pardon, sir, but hadn't you better cock your pistol, sir? Well, yes, said Hornblower, exasperated at his own forgetfulness. He drew the hammer back with a click, and the menacing sound made more acute still the French captain's sense of his own danger, with a cocked and loaded pistol pointed direct at his stomach in a heaving boat. He waved his hands desperately. Please, he said, point that some other way, sir. He drew farther back, huddling against the men behind him. Hey, avast there, you, shouted Matthews loudly. A French sailor was trying to let go the halyard unobserved. Shoot any man that looks dangerous, Matthews. He was so intent on forcing his will upon these men, so anxiously desperate to retain his liberty, that his face was contracted into a beast-like scowl. No one looking at him could doubt his determination for a moment. He would allow no human life to come between him and his decisions. There was still a third pistol in his belt, and the Frenchman could guess that if they tried to, uh, if they tried to rush, a quarter of them at least would meet their deaths before they overpowered the Englishman, and the French captain knew that he'd be the first to die. His expressive hands waving from his sides, he could not take his eyes from the pistol, told his men to make no further resistance. The murmurings died away, and the captain began to plead. Five years I was in an English prison during the last war, he said. Let us reach an agreement. Let us grow to France. When we reach the shore, anywhere you choose, sir, we will land and you can continue on your journey. Or we can all land, and I will use all of my influence to have you and your men sent back to England under cartel, without exchange or ransom. I swear I will. No, said Hornblower flatly. England was far easier to reach from here than from the French Biscay coast. And as for the other suggestion... Hornblower knew enough about the new government washed up by the revolution in France to be sure that they would never part with prisoners on the, rep on the reputation of a merchant captain. And trade seamen were scarce in France. It was his duty to keep these dozen from returning. No, he said in reply to the captain's fresh protests. Shall I clad him on the jaw there, sir? asked Hunter at Hornblower's side. No, said Hornblower again, but the Frenchman saw the gesture and guessed at the meaning of the words, subsiding into sullen silence. But he was roused again at the sight of Hornblower's pistol on his knee, still pointed at him. A sleepy finger might press that trigger. Sir, put that pistol away, I beg of you, it is dangerous. Hornblower's eye was, eye was cold and unsympathetic. Put it away, please. I will do nothing to interfere with your command of this boat, I promise you that. Do you swear it? I swear it. And these others? The captain looked around at his crew with voluble explanations, and grudgingly they agreed. They swear I too. Very well, then. Hornblower started to replace the pistol in his belt, and remembered to put it on half-cock in time to shave himself from shooting himself in the stomach. Everyone on the boat relaxed into apathy. The boat was rising and swooping rhythmically now, a far more comfortable motion than when it had jerked to a sea anchor, and Hornblower's stomach lost some of its resentment. He had been two nights without sleep, his head lowered on his chest, and then he leaned sideways against Hunter and slept peacefully while the boat, with the wind nearly abeam, headed steadily for England. What woke him late in the day was when Matthews, cramped and weary, was compelled to surrender the tiller to Carson, and after that they kept watch and watch, 
a hand at the sheet and a hand at the tiller, and the others trying to rest. Hornblower took his turn at the sheet, but he would not trust himself with the tiller, especially when night fell. He knew he had not the knack of keeping the boat on her course by the feel of the wind on his cheek and the tiller in his hand. It was not until long after breakfast the next day, almost noon in fact, that they sighted the sail. It was a Frenchman who saw it first, and his excited crow cry roused them all. There were three square topsails coming over the horizon on their weather bow, nearing them so rapidly on a converging course that each time the boat rose on a wave considerably greater area of canvas was visible. What do you think she is, Matthews? asked Hornblower, while the French while the boat buzzed with the Frenchman's excitement. I can't tell, sir, but I don't like the look of her, said Matthews doubtfully. She ought to have a to gallant set in this breeze. And of course is too, and she hasn't. And I don't like the cut of her jib, sir. She might be a Frenchie to me. Any ship travelling for peaceful purposes would naturally have set all possible sails set. This ship had not. Hence she was engaged in some belligerent design, but there were more chances that she was British than she was French, even here in the bay. Hornblower took a long look at her, a smallish vessel, although ship-rigged, flush-decked, with a look of speed about her. Her hull was visible at intervals now, with a line of gun, po gun ports. She looks French all over to me, sir, said Hunter. Privateer, seemly. Stand by to jibe, said Hornblower. They brought the boat round before the wind, heading directly away from the ship. But in war, as in the jungle, to fly is, in, is to invite pursuit and attack. The ship set courses and to gallants and came tearing down upon them, passed them at half a cable's length, and then hove to, having cut off their escape. The ship's rail was lined with a curious crowd, a large crew for a vessel of that size. A hail came from across the water to the boat, and the words were French. The English seamen subsided into curses, while well, the French captain cheerfully stood up, stood up and replied, and the French crew brought the boat about alongside the ship. A handsome young man in a plum-coloured coat with a lace stock greeted Hornblower when he stepped on the deck. Welcome, sir, to the peak, he said in French. Je suis Captain Noville of this privateer. Et vous, midshipman Hornblower, of his, his Britannic Majesty's ship indefatigable, growled Hornblower. Oh, you seem to be in evil humour. Please do not so be distressed at the fortunes of war. You will be accommodated in this ship until we return to port, with every possible comfort at sea. I beg of you, too, to consider yourself quite at all. Uh, for instance, those pistols in your belt uh, must discommode you more than a little. Permit me to relieve you of their weight. He took the pistols neatly from Hornblower's belt as he spoke, looked Hornblower keenly over, and then went on. Uh, that dirk you wear at your side, sir, would you oblige me by the loan of it? I assure you that I will return it to you when we part company, but while you are on board here, I fear that your impetuous youth might lead you to some uh, rash act while you are wearing a weapon with a credulous mind. Might believe to be lethal. Merci. And now, might I show you to the berth that is being prepared for you? With a courteous bow, he led the way below. Two decks down, presumably at the level of a foot or two below the waterline, was a wide bare tween decks, dimly lighted and scantily ventilated by the hatchways. Our slave deck, explained Noville carelessly. Slave deck? asked Hornblower. Oh, yes. It is here that the slaves were once confined during the middle passage. Much was clear to Hornblower at once. A slave ship could be readily converted into a privateer. She would already be armed with plenty of guns to defend herself against treacherous attacks while making her purchases in the African rivers. She was faster than the average merchant ship, both because of the lack of need to hold uh, of hold space, and because with a desire of the highly perishable cargo such as slaves, speed was a desirable quality, and she was constructed to carry large numbers of men, and the great quantities of food and water necessary to keep them supplied while out while at sea in search of prizes. Our market in San Domingo has been closed to us by recent events, of which you surely must have held, sir, went on Noville. And so that the peak could continue to return dividends to me, I have converted her into a privateer. Moreover, seeing that the activities of the Committee of Public Safety at present make Paris a more unhealthy spot than even the west coast of Africa, I decided to take command of my vessel myself. 
to say nothing of the fact that a certain resolution and hardihood are necessary to make a privateer a profitable investment. Novil's face hardened for a moment into an expression of the grimmest determination, and then softened at once into its previous meaningless politeness. Uh, the store in the bulkhead, he continued, leads to the quarters I have set aside for captured officers. Here, as you see, is your cot. Uh, please make yourself at home here. Should the ship go into action, and as I trust she will, and will frequently do, uh, the hatches above you will be battened down. But except on those occasions, you will of course be at liberty to move about the ship at your will. Yet I suppose I had better add that any harebrained attempt on the part of the prisoners to interfere with the working or well-being of the ship would be deeply resented by the crew. Uh, they serve on shares, you understand, and are risking their lives and their liberty. I would not be surprised if any rash person who endangered their dividends uh, and freedom were dropped over the side into the sea. Hornblower forced himself to reply. He would not reveal that he was almost struck dumb by the calculating callousness of that last speech. I understand, he said. Excellent. Now, is there anything further you may need, sir? Hornblower looked around the bare quarters of which he was to suffer lonely confi confinement lit by a dim glimmer of light from a swinging slush lamp. Uh, could I have something to read? he asked. Novil thought for a moment. Well, I fear they are only professional books. Uh, but I can uh, let you have Grand Jean's Principles of Navigation and Le Brun's Handbook on Seamanship and some similar volumes, if you think you can understand the French in which they are written. Oh, I'll try, said Hornblower. Probably it was as well that Hornblower was provided with the materials for such strenuous mental exercise. The efforts of reading French and of studying his profession at once kept his mind busy during the dreary days while the peak cruised in search of prizes. He had to force himself upon Newville once to protest against the employment of his four British seamen on the menial work of pumping out the ship, but he had to retire worsted from the argument, if argument it could be called, when Newville icily refused to discuss the question. Hornblower went back to his quarters with burning cheeks and red ears. And, as ever, when he returned, he was mentally disturbed. The thought of his guilt returned to him with new force. If only he had plugged that shot hole sooner. A clearer-headed officer, he told himself, would have done so. He had lost his ship, the indefatigable's precious prize, and there was no health in him. Sometimes he made himself review the situation calmly. Professionally, he might not, probably would not, suffer for his negligence. A midshipman with only four for a prize crew put on board a 200-ton brig that had been subjected to considerable firing from a frigate's gun would not be seriously blamed when she sank under him. But Hornblower knew at the same time that he was at least partly at fault. If it was ignorance, there was no excuse for ignorance. If he had, if he had allowed his multiple cares to distract him from the business of plugging the shot hole immediately, well, that was incompetence, and there was no excuse for incompetence. When he thought along those lines, he was overwhelmed by waves of despair and self-contempt, and there was no one to comfort him. The day of his birthday, when he looked at himself at the vast age of eighteen, was the worst of all. Eighteen and a discredited prisoner in the hands of a French privateer. His self-respect was at its lowest ebb. The peak was seeking her prey in the most frequented waters in the world, the approaches to the channel, and there could be no more vivid demonstrations of the vastness of the ocean than the fact that she cruised day after day without glimpsing a sail. She maintained a triangular course, reaching to the northwest before tacking again to the south, running under easy sail northeasternly again, with lookouts at every masthead, with nothing to see but the tossing waste of water. Until the morning, when a high-pitched yell from the fore topsail ga or top gallant masthead attracted the attention of everybody on deck including Hornblower, standing lonely in the waist. Noville, by the wheel, bellowed a question to the lookout, and Hornblower, thanks to his recent studies, could translate the answer. There was a sail visible to windward, and the next moment the lookout reported that it had altered course and was running down towards them. That meant a great deal. In wartime, any merchant ship would be suspicious of strangers and would give them as wide a berth as possible and especially when she was to windward, and therefore far safer. Only somebody prepared to fight, or possessed of a perfectly morbid curiosity, would abandon a windward position. A wild and unreasonable hope filled Hornblower's breast, a ship of war at sea, 
thanks to England's maritime mastery, would be far more probably English than French. And this was the cruising ground of the Indefatigable, his own ship, stationed there specifically to fulfil the double function of looking out for French commerce destroyers and intercepting French blockade runners. A hundred miles from here, she had put him and his prize crew on board the Marie Galant. It was a thousand to one, he exaggerated despairingly to himself, against any ship sighted being the indefatigable. But, hope reasserted itself, the fact that she was coming down to investigate reduced the odds ten to one at most. Less than ten to one. He looked over at Noville, trying to, th trying to think his thoughts. The peak was fast and handy, and there was a clear avenue of escape to leeward. The fact that the stranger had altered course towards them was a suspicious circumstance, but it was known that Indiamen, the richest prizes of all, had sometimes traded on the similarity of their appearance to that of ships of the line, and by showing a bold front had scared dangerous enemies away. That would be a temptation to a man eager to make a prize. At Noville's orders, all sail was set, ready for instant flight or pursuit, and, close hauled, the peak stood towards the stranger. It was not long before Homeblower, on the deck, caught a glimpse of a gleam of white, like a tiny grain of rice, far away on the horizon, as the peak lifted on a swell. Here came Matthews, red-faced and excited, running aft to Hornblower's side. That's the Indy, sir! I swear it! He sprang on to the rail, holding on by the shrouds and stared under his hand. It is her, sir! She's loose in her royals now! We'll be back on board in time for grog. A French petty officer reached up and dragged Matthews by the seat of his trousers from his perch, and with a blow and a kick, drove him forward again, while a moment later, Noville was shouting the orders that the ship should wear round to head directly away from the indefatigable. Noville beckoned Hornblower over to his side. Your late ship, I understand, Mr. Hornblower. Yes. What is our best point of sailing? Hornblower's eyes met Noville's. Do not look so noble, said Noville, smiling with thin lips. I could undoubtedly un induce you to give me this information. I know of ways. It is unnecessary, fortunately for you. There is no ship on earth, especially none of his Britannic Majesty's clumsy frigates, that can outstay the peak running before the wind. You will still see that. He strolled to the taffrail and looked after long and earnestly through his glass, but no more earnestly than did Hornblower with his naked eye. You see, said Noville, proffering the glass. <laughs> Hornblower took it, but no more than to catch a closer glimpse of his ship than to confirm his observations. He was homesick desperately homesick at that moment, for the indefatigable. But there could be no denying that she was being left fast behind. Her tagallants were well out of sight now, and only her royals were visible. Two hours and we shall have run our mastheads under, said Noville, taking back the telescope and shutting it with a snap. He left Hornblower standing sorrowful at the taffrail, while he turned to berate the helmsman for not steering a steadier course. Hornblower heard the explosive words without listening to them the wind blowing into his face and ruffling his hair over his ears, and the wake of the ship's passage boiling below him. So might Adam have looked back at Eden. Hornblower remembered the stuffy, dark midshipman's berth, the smells and the creakings, the bitter cold nights, turning out in response to the call for all hands, the weevily bread and the wooden beef, and he yearned for them all, with the, sickness fe with the sick feeling of hopeless longing. Liberty was vanishing over the horizon. Yet it was not these personal feelings that drove him below in search of action. They may have quickened his wits, but it was a sense of duty which inspired him. The slave deck was deserted, as usual, with all hands at quarters. Beyond the bulkhead stood his cart with the books upon it, and the slush lamp swaying above it. There was nothing there to give him any inspiration. There was another locked door in the after bulkhead. That opened into some kind of boatswain's store. Twice he had seen it unlocked, and paint and similar supplies brought out from it. Paint! That gave him an idea. He looked from the door up to the slush lamp and back again, and as he stepped forward, he took his clasp knife out of his pocket. But before very long, he recoiled again, sneering at himself. The door was not panelled, but was made of two solid slabs of wood with the cross beams on the inside. There was the keyhole of the lock, but it presented no point of attack, and it would take him hours and hours to cut through that door with his knife, at a time when minutes were precious. His heart was beating feverishly, but no more feverishly than his mind was working. As he looked round again, he reached up to the lamp and shook it, nearly full. 
There was a moment when he stood hesitantly, nerving himself, and then he threw himself into action. With a ruthless hand, he tore the pages out of Grand Jean's Prin uh, Principe de la Navigation, crumpling them up into small quantities into little loose balls which he laid at the foot of the door. He threw off his uniform coat and dragged his blue woolen jersey over his head. His long, powerful fingers tore it across and plucked eagerly as if to unrav it, unravel it. After starting some loose threads, he would not waste more time on it, and dropped the garment onto the paper and looked round again. The mattress of the cot, it was stuffed with straw, by God. A slash of his knife tore open the ticking, and he scooped the stuff out of it by the armful. Constant pressure had almost solidified it, but he shook it and handled it so that it bulked out far larger in mass on the deck, nearly up to his waist. That would give him the intense blaze he wanted. He stood still, compelling himself to think clearly and logically. It was impetuosity and lack of thought which had occasioned the loss of the Marie Gallant and now he had wasted time on his jersey. He worked out the successive steps to take. He made a long spill out of a page of the Manuel de Matelage and lighted it with the lamp. Then he poured out the grease. The lamp was hot and the grease liquid over his bowls of paper, over the deck, over the base of the door. A touch from his taper lighted one bowl, and the flame travelled quickly. He was committed now. He piled straw upon the flames, and in a sudden access of insane strength, he tore the cot from its fastenings, smashing it as he did so, and piled the fragments on the straw. Already the flames were racing through the straw. He dropped the lamp upon the pile, grabbed his coat, and walked out. He thought of closing the door, but then decided against it. The more air, the better. He wriggled on into his coat and ran up the ladder. On deck, he forced himself to lounge nonchalantly against the rail, putting his shaking hands into his pockets. His excitement made him weak, nor was it lessened as he waited. Every minute before the fire could be discovered was important. A French officer said something to him with a triumphant laugh, and pointed something to and pointed to something aft over the taffrail, presumably speaking about leaving the indefatigable behind. Hornblower smiled bleakly at him. That was the first gesture that, occur that, that occurred to him. And then he thought that that smile was out of place, and he tried to assume a sullen scowl. The wind was blowing briskly, so that the peak could only just carry all plain sail. Hornblower felt it on his cheeks, which were burning. Everyone on deck seemed unnaturally busy and preoccupied. Noville was watching the helmsman with occasional glances aloft to see that every sail was doing its work. The men were at the guns, two hands and a petty officer he heaving the log. God, how much longer would he have? Look there. The coming of the after hatchway appeared distorted, wavering in the shimmering air. Hot air must be coming up through it. And was that, or was it not, the ghost of a wreath of smoke? It was. In that moment, the alarm was given. A loud cry, a rush of feet, an instant bustle, the loud beating of a drum, high-pitched shouts, O oh, foe! O oh, foe! The four elements of Aristotle, thought Hornblower insanely. Earth air, water, and fire, were the constant enemies of the seamen, but the lee shore, the gale, and the wave were none of them as feared in wooden ships as fire. Timbers many years old and coated thick with paint burned fiercely and readily. Sails and tarry rigging would burn like fireworks, and within the ship were tons upon tons of gunpowder, waiting its chance to blast the seamen into fragments. Hornblower watched the fire parties flinging themselves into their work, Pumps being dragged over the decks, the, ho the hoses rigged. Someone came aft with a message for Noville, presumably to report the sight of the fire. Noville heard him, and darted a glance at Hornblower against the rail before he hurled orders back up at the messenger. The smoke coming up through the after hatchway was dense now. At Noville's orders, the afterguard flung themselves down the opening through the smoke. And there was more smoke. More smoke, and yet more smoke, smoke called up by the following wind and blown forward in wisps. Smoke must be pouring out of the sides of the ship at the waterline. Noville took a stride towards Hornblower, his face working with rage, but a cry from the helmsman checked him. The helmsman, unable to take his hands from the wheel, pointed with his foot to the cabin skylight. There was a flickering of flame below it. A side pane fell in as they watched, and a rush of flame came through the opening. That store of paint... Hornblower calculated. He was calmer now, with a calm that would astonish him later when he came to look back on it, 
must be immediately under the cabin, and blazing fiercely. Noville looked around him at the sea and at the sky, and put his hands to his head in a furious gesture. For the first time in his life, Hornblower saw a man literally tearing his hair out. But his nerve held. A shout brought up another portable pump. Four men set to work on the handles, and the clank, clank, clank made an accompaniment that blended with the roar of the fire. A thin jet of water was skirted down the gaping skylight. More men formed a bucket chain, drawing water from the sea and passing it from hand to hand to pour in the skylight. But those buckets of water were less effective even than the stream from the pumps. From below came the dull thud of an explosion, and Hornblower caught his breath as he expected the ship to be blown to pieces. But no further explosion followed. Either a gun had been set off by the flames, or a cask had burst violently in the heat, and then the bucket line suddenly disintegrated. Beneath the feet of one of the men a seam had gaped in broad red smile, from which came a rush of flame. Some officer had seized Noville by the arm, and was arguing with him vehemently, and Hornblower could see Noville yield in despair. Hands were sent scurrying aloft to get in the fore topsail and the fore course, and other hands went to the main braces. Over went the wheel, and the peak came up into the wind. Then the change was dramatic, although at first more apparent than real. With the wind blowing in the opposite direction, the roar of the fire did not come so clearly to the ears of those forward of it, but it was an immense gain all the same. The flames which had started in steerage in the farthest part aft of the ship no longer were blown forward, but were instead turned back upon timber already half consumed. Yet the after part of the deck was fully alight. The helmsman was driven from the wheel, and in a flash the flames took hold of the driver and consumed it utterly. One moment the sail was there, and the next there was only charred fragments hanging from the gaff. But head to wind, the other sails did not catch, and a mizzen trysail hurriedly set kept the ship's bows on. It was then that Hornblower, looking forward, saw the indefatigable again. She was tearing down toward them with all sails set. As the peak lifted, he could see the white bow wave foaming under her bow spirit. There was no question about surrender. For under the menace of that row of guns, no ship of the peak's force, even if uninjured, could resist. A cable's length to windward, the indefatigable rounded too, and she was hoisting out her boats before she was even fully round. Pellew had seen the smoke, and had deduced the reason for the peak's heaving too, and had made his preparations as he came up. Longboat and launch had each carried a pump in their bows, where sometimes they carried a carronade. They dropped down into the stern of the peak, to cast their jets of water up into the flaming stern without more ado. Two gigs full of men ran straight aft to join the battle with the flames, but Bolton, the third lieutenant, lingered for a moment as he caught Hornblower's eye. "'Good God, it's you!' he exclaimed. "'What the devil are you doing there?' Yet he did not stay for an answer. He picked out Noville as the captain of the peak, strode aft to receive his surrender, cast his eye aloft to see that all was well there, and then took up the task of combating the fire. The flames were overcome in time more because they had consumed everything within reach of them than for any other reason. The peak was burned from the taffrail forehead for some feet of her length, right to the water's edge, so that she presented a strange spectacle when viewed from the deck of the indefatigable. Nevertheless, she was in no immediate danger. Given even moderate good fortune and a little hard work, she could be sailed to England to be repaired and sent to sea again. But it was not a salvage that was important but rather the fact that she was no longer in French hands, would no longer be available to prey upon English commerce. That was the point that Sir Edward Pellew made in conversation with Hornblower, when the latter came on board to report himself. Hornblower had begun, at Pellew's order, by recounting what had happened to him from the time he had been sent as the prize master on board the Marie Gallant. As Hornblower had expected, perhaps even as he had feared, Pellew had passed lightly over the loss of the brig. She had been damaged by gunfire before surrendering, and no one now could establish whether the damage was small or whether it was great. Pelly did not give the matter a second thought. Hornblower had tried to save her and had been unsuccessful with his tiny crew, and at the moment the indefatigable could not spare him a larger crew. He did not hold Hornblower culpable. Once again, it was much more important that France should be deprived of the Marie Gallant's cargo than that England should benefit by it. The situation was exactly parallel to that of the salvaging of the peak, it was lucky she caught fire like that, commented Pellew, looking across to where the peak lay, still hovering too with the boats clustering about her with only the thinnest trail of smoke now drifting from her stern. 
she was running clean away from us, and would have been out of sight within the hour. Have you any idea how it happened, Mr. Hornblower? Hornblower was naturally expecting that question, and in fact was ready for it. Now was the time to answer truthfully, and modestly, to receive the praise he deserved. A mention in the Gazette, perhaps even an appointment as acting lieutenant. Pellew did not know the full details of the loss of the brig. It might make a false estimate of them, even if he did. No, sir, said Hornblower. I think it must have been a spontaneous combustion in the paint locker. I can't account for it otherwise. He alone knew of his remissness in plugging that shot hole. He alone could decide on his punishment, and this was what he had chosen. This alone could re-establish him in his own eyes. And when the words were spoken, he felt an enormous relief, and not one single twinge of regret. It was fortunate, all the same, mused Pellew.